Okay, let's begin the presentation today. So um, welcome everybody to the Impact Research Seminar for May. Um, and um, to begin the meeting, I'd like to acknowledge that um, we're coming to you from various First Nations lands around Australia, but also internationally for this particular meeting. So today I'm on the land of the Darawal people, um, and I pay my respects of the tradition of custodianship for which they have cared and continue to care for this country um, for many thousands of years. So it's a great pleasure to introduce to you today Yanis Arles, um, who's a doctoral candidate in the School of Physics and Astronomy at, the, at Monash University and part of the Monash um, X-ray Imaging Group. Um, Yanis previously graduated from the University of Auckland with a Bachelor of Science in Physics and Mathematics and from the University of Canterbury with a Bachelor in Science with Honours in Medical Physics. And he's supported by the Australian Government Research Training RTP Scholarship. Uh, Yanis is, is studying novel signal modalities which allow entirely new properties of a sample to be explored in the context of experimentally simple uh, propagation-based um, X-ray imaging techniques. And these modalities include phase contrast imaging, which studies how the phase of the X-ray changes in a sample, as well as dark field X-ray imaging, which enables the quantification of the scattering of X-rays of very small structures in the sample. Yanis is interested in exploring how spectral techniques can be used for coherent X-ray imaging and in the application of these techniques to the imaging of the lung. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Yanis and a very warm welcome to you. All right, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you everyone for coming uh, this late in the afternoon or very early as it may be. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak a little bit about what I've been doing in my research. So today I'll speak a little bit about uh, lung imaging, uh, specifically at the IMBL, the Imaging and Medical Beamline at the Australian Synchrotron. And um, that'll be, first of all, in the context of uh, talking about the lung imaging sub-project of um, the IMPACT project and the IMPACT grant, and um, presenting a few first results um, from the first experiment under that sub-project, which was done uh, sort of towards the middle of last year. Um, and then also talking a little bit about um, some slightly ancillary research uh, that I've been focusing on the last little while about uh, doing dark field imaging as well, um, uh, using dual energy information. So first of all, just a quick brief uh, reminder to everyone what about, uh, about uh, project four of the IMPACT grant, uh, which is about looking at establishing propagation-based CD imaging for um, uh, lung cancer specifically at the IMBL and there's two main goals to that project the first one is um, sort of uh, general whole lung assessment um, for lung cancer and whole lung screening and uh, as well as region of interest studies and um, which would then be about characterizing uh, more suspicious parts of the lung and having a closer look at those so today I'll be talking uh, more towards the first point. The second point is uh, also something that was looked at in these um, experiments last year, um, but that's being worked on more by a new PhD student in our group, Lucy Costello, who I'm sure you'll be hearing from in the future. And uh, so I'll talk more about uh, some of the challenges with whole lung imaging. So to tell you a bit about what was done last year, we had a, uh, a, a phantom um, come down from Sydney called Lungman, which is this um, a urethane plastic torso, essentially, uh, which has some sort of higher uh, density bony structure in it and a big um, empty cavity inside that can be filled with a variety of uh, inserts uh, for various purposes. And our goal initially was just to sort of get it in there and see whether or not it's useful for um, phase contrast imaging and to perhaps um, do some first optimization of things like propagation distance, energy, um, and uh, sort of the reconstruction workflow for lungs. Uh, so we used uh, two main inserts. Um, one is a vascular tree, um, which sort of models a little bit a kind of um, pseudo bronchial structure, except that it's inverted and that the air is on the outside and you have high density material on the inside. And then also 
this um, urethane foam on the right. Uh, and that, of course, um, models the kind of alveolar structure of the lungs and uh, gets us closer towards some of the behavior that we get from those, such as dark field. So to jump the gun a little bit, I just wanted to give you an idea of what some of the images of these look like. So for the um, tree, you, you get this kind of uh, typical um, bronchial structure type looking thing. And um, perhaps uh, this is giving away a bit, but clearly uh, you might be able to discern that there's some face ranges happening in there. And then for the urethane foam, what we of course see is the sort of characteristic speckle, which is typical for lung imaging and um, is sort of another component to lung imaging, which is um, we're gonna have to deal with, excuse me, or exploit. And also, um, of course, the fact that you have all these uh, interfaces leads to strong scattering and uh, dark field effects, which is something else that we're gonna be look at, looking at. So what was actually done at that first experiment? Uh, it was quite a large parameter space. So we kind of took a lot of data over the, four or five days, I think it was, um, with three detectors, uh, Zinios, Iger, and Ruby, the three sort of main detectors at IBL, five distances, four energies, and the two lung inserts that I've just shown you, as well as some just shredded um, heterogeneous neoprene foam uh, that we use as well, and then a variety of little uh, tumor um, phantoms uh, at different sizes, as well as some data that was taken to do the symmetry. And now Ruby was more for a region of interest uh, things, of course, because of the small field of view. So I'll be focusing more on Zinios and Aiga today. But first of all, um, one thing to note at IMBL <clears throat> is the fact that at the different energies, you have very different uh, beam sizes. So the shape of your beam changes considerably, which is something that will um, is something that we'll have to take into account once we start getting to the stages of uh, trying to figure out. Um, a, a protocol for lung imaging. Um, of course, at the high energy, uh, you have a much narrower beam, which might be a disadvantage if you want to image a whole lung. Um, so that's something which is just definitely good to keep in mind. And we didn't actually get all of the um, roll off at the lowest energies in uh, for this one. I'm um, just down to about 2000 counts in the flat field. Um, now we looked at uh, two different detectors, Zinyos and Iger. Um, where, of course, Sinios uh, is a flat panel detector, 30 by 30 centimeters field of view, and about 100 uh, micron pixel size. And Iga is this new, fancy, expensive um, photo counting detector that can also do energy discriminating um, imaging, which is something we'll get to later. Um, but roughly similar field of view, roughly similar uh, order of magnitude pixel size. Um, and one of the things which was very quickly, very clearly evident uh, with these experiments is that um, the, the sort of resolution um, with Sinios is just uh, much too low to, to be able to resolve any of the phase ranges that we were seeing beautifully with Iger um, from lung men. So most of our subsequent analysis has been done so far with Iger. Of course, I'll go back as well and, and, and uh, do some of the quantitative stuff with Sinios as well in order to make that comparison. But it's, it was a pretty clear case here. And I think with the mammography project, there's been some back and forth about um, uh, either one, but uh, here it was very clear for us. This is just a little example of a, a section in one of the slices, just to show again uh, the significant difference. So this was of course at the same energy and distance um, and non-phase retrieved. So one of the um, goals for this uh, experiment was that we wanted to implement a new method of estimating a phase retrieval parameter so of course, for our typical um, propagation-based <clears throat> phase retrieval, um, Pagan and Nadal 2002, uh, you have this um, phase retrieval parameter, gamma, which is uh, theoretically is just related to the refractive index um, or, or difference between the, the two materials in the interface, but that can vary a little bit with point spread um, blurring, et cetera. And um, of course, if you don't know what those materials are, then you have to have some other way of, of estimating that parameter. Uh, so this is a method that we implemented now, but um, is originally from Samantha Alu et al. in Optics Letters 2022, um, and it's a very nice little method. So what you do is you, you take one of these phase fringes and um, look at a, a 
series of line profiles across that and kind of average them. And this is just something that I implemented to average a bunch of line profiles across an interface like this. And what she did was um, implement a model for a, sort of a typical phase range that you see in terms of an error function, which is then modulated by an exponential to sort of model the kind of over and under um, dampening due to phase retrieval. And so your goal is to try and get this C term effectively to be zero, to be as close as possible to a perfect step function, error function. And so you take your data and you do a, a fitting to that to, to, to find these beta parameters essentially. And, um, and then you get a, 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 in some sense, optimal um, uh, phase retrieval. So I wanted to present this. It's not my work to be very clear about this, but I wanted to present it because I think we might be the first ones who are implementing it. And it's a very nice method to quickly um, find some optimal phase retrieval parameters. So we're implementing it for the line imaging. Uh, now, in terms of some of the initial results from uh, image quality assessment from all our many, many uh, CT reconstructions and slices, well over a terabyte, I just want to show some initial um, results. It's all pretty preliminary. I just want to make that very clear. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but um, I just want to give you a flavor of what we're kind of looking at in terms of doing for um, the, this, the, these first results. Um, so the first thing to note is that we have a pretty significant beam roll off at all of the energies. And so we're planning to use that also for uh, assessment of different um, flux or dose levels. So something along the lines of, these are some initial plots that have come out of the analysis so far. Um, they don't necessarily mean anything just yet, but something along the lines of this. So for different uh, slices down, um, they have very different flux levels from top to bottom. And so we can look at how the, CNR, for example, in this case, varies with flux. Uh, the other aspect, of course, is resolution, which comes into it as well. So these are a couple of uh, slices, probably not visibly that you can see anything in those, much too, much too small. But I just wanted to show you a couple of slices at different energies and distances. These are both with IGA and phase retrieved using sort of optimal phase retrieval parameters found using the method that I just described. And so what we're doing is taking some feature that we're interested in, uh, also sort of averaging some line profiles across it and um, essentially finding a full width at half maximum of the, of the line profile derivative in order to estimate a, a resolution parameter. And the reason why is because uh, I'm using um, this uh, image quality or uh, assessment um, parameter or what are you gonna call it, which is CNR over res, which I think has been shown to be fairly close to radiological assessment um, compared to other methods of assessing image quality objectively. Uh, so these are just some very early results uh, at different energies and distances and looking at uh, CNR over res. So these two images over here are seem to be amongst the best and worst combinations of parameters for this particular phantom. Um, and we can also very clearly see that if we just look at a, a little section of it, uh, a little detail in the middle here, this is the kind of um, uh, trachea going up through the, um, uh, through the, not the trachea, sorry, this is like a, um, what is this meant to be? I think it's the meant to be aorta or something, some, some aspect of the mediastinum inside the lungman, which has this kind of um, hard set foam that was used inside it. So you get these nice uh, uh, bubbles and features that one can look at. And so um, I think it's fairly clear to most people uh, that this top one here is, is quite a bit better in terms of um, being able to resolve some of those details. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavor of what's going on in terms of the initial data from um, that uh, sub-project of the impact grant. Um, I want to move on now to sort of the other half, in some sense, of the work that I've been doing for my PhD up to this point, which is looking at dark field. So I'm sure pretty much everyone who's listening um, will know a little bit about dark field, but I thought I'd give just a very quick brief overview again, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So when we're talking about dark field, we're kind of talking about the, the third modality in some way. You have your typical attenuation um, contrast, 
And now uh, phase sprint is coming in when you have a coherent um, X-rays. And the other thing that you start to see is that when you have some aspect of the object, which um, is highly scattering, you get effectively a small angle a scattering leading to what is effectively a blurring of uh, the image in that region. And there's been a variety of techniques developed to do dark field imaging, um, which I'll just briefly uh, go over. So things like analyzer-based imaging, where you're um, effectively picking out uh, part of the, um, uh, how, to, how to say, part of the refraction pattern using a crystal, and and by sort of rocking it slightly, you can you can see how those um, very sensitively measure how those uh, beams have shifted and and blurred using um, uh, from the dark field. Uh, very um, advanced technique, which has already been implemented clinically over in Germany, is um, grating based interferometry, where you use several gratings and you use um, basically a more pattern from the two gratings. To, to measure the, um, the change in visibility and shift of the pattern of the grating due to these effects. And also things like speckle-based imaging, um, which uh, where you just put a, a speckle pattern in front and measure how that speckle pattern is, is shifted and diffused by the sample. And so you get these beautiful images. I'm sure everyone has seen this image many, many times. <laughs> you can never see it enough, I think. Um, and of course, you have the, the usual thing where you have uh, water and sugar, which have very similar attenuation. So they look similar there. But when you look at the scattering, the, all the interfaces in the sugar give you a very strong dark field or something like these glasses, which are a solid plastic. And so they attenuate fairly strongly. And all the tissue paper that's been wrapped around it um, barely attenuates, so you don't see it. But then in the scattering, all the fibers in the tissue paper strongly scatter. And that's what comes out in the dark field. Um, and of course, dark field imaging is particularly interesting for lungs and lung imaging because of all the alveoli in the lung, you get all these beautiful inf interfaces and um, you can start to make some measurements of uh, the structure of the lung that you can't do with attenuation and phase contrast. There was this beautiful video, which is playing, oh well, um, from some of the work in 2018 by Karl Edala. So these are beautiful techniques and uh, they get some very nice images, um, but they are very complex. They're very sensitive and they require uh, often very expensive equipment um, that's difficult to set up, et cetera. So the question we wanna ask, especially in the context of the impact ground and the work being done to get um, phase contrast imaging, uh, propagation-based phase contrast imaging set up clinically is to say, can we just use propagation-based images that have no uh, pattern modulated onto the beam, no interferometry done or anything like that. Can we just use that and also start to look at dark field in some way? So there was some beautiful work done last year by uh, Thomas Leatham et al, um, who's one of the, uh, Thomas is one of the fellow PhD students here at Monash. Um, and he looked at this and said, well, if you measure, um, your field at two points, at uh, two propagation distances, uh, both the, uh, both the um, uh, phase effects and the dark field effects vary strongly with distance because of course with the dark field it's effectively just a diffusion cone, uh, a Sachs uh, cone. Um, and the attenuation doesn't change of course because that's defined after your sample. So by measuring your, your um, image at two different propagation distances, you can kind of tease apart these two effects and, and using a single material assumption, just like with usual um, uh, phase retrieval, Pagan style phase retrieval, um, you can separate those and also do dark field imaging. And so this is great, of course, and um, new paradigm for dark field imaging, but it does, mean that you have to move your sample a significant distance down the line and take another image. And of course, when you're looking at something like clinical imaging at IMBL, where you have a patient there, it might be a little tricky to, to take two images, registration, et cetera, is a little tricky. Um, however, 
At IMBEL, IMBEL we have uh, the IGO detector, which is an energy discriminating detector. So why not use two different um, energy levels, lower energy and high energy photons, in order to uh, look at dark fields? Because, of course, dark field, um, which is just coming from X-ray scattering, is much, much stronger at the lower energies, uh, just like the phase effects. And so you can potentially also um, separate these two effects uh, down the line. Um, and that's what I've been looking at for most of my PhD thus far, uh, is this dual energy dark field, PVI dark field imaging. So there are some problems that come in here. Um, the big one being, of course, that then your attenuation also changes with different energies. If you have a multi-material sample, that gets a little tricky. But just to show you uh, what this looks like, I just want to show you uh, one of the samples we imaged at IMBL for this project. And what we have here is a sort of cloth, mesh cloth bag, if you will. You can see the pattern of the bag here um, with a variety of, of things placed in it. I mean, this is a sort of, you know, you can imagine a handbag, a security screening, something like this is what we're thinking of here. So we have a pencil, a makeup brush. Um, this is just a little Eppendorf tube filled with uh, microspheres, six micron PMMA microspheres. Um, this is a little plastic playing piece that you might use in a board game. And this is a plastic hair comb in the background there. So you have all these samples, and you can probably already imagine which of these samples will give you strong scattering and dark field. So if we just look at uh, a small region, hopefully this comes out well on your side. It's a little bit subtle. But for example, you may notice that this pattern from the cloth bag, which is kind of this mesh pattern here, um, it's, it's fairly visible in this higher energy image, even through the, the pencil and these microspheres. Um, but it gets very blurred out uh, at the lower energy. And here you can actually see it kind of become more and more blurred out as the, as the wood of the pencil becomes thicker and thicker. And those wood grains, as well as the, the little grains of compressed graphite powder and blur it out. The same in the microspheres. Here you can actually also see that there is some uh, speckle coming out of the microspheres at the high energy image, which is uh, blurred out and lost at the lower energy image. So clearly with different energies, we can see dark field effects coming through and perhaps we can use those to do um, dark field imaging. So, um, Let's take a step back from, from this data and maybe just go back to simulated data for a second because that's much nicer <laughs> and easier. Uh, so this was just a simulation that I did with um, uh, just some random geometric shapes. So this is kind of a projected thickness uh, um, simulated. Um, this is a, a dark field diffusion coefficient essentially. So the dark field image, which is uh, what we're simulating and then hopefully reconstructing at the end. And then these are a couple of um, images at different energies. Um, and you can maybe vaguely see that uh, where there is strong dark field at the lower energy, some of the patterning that's present in the high energy image has been uh, diffused a little bit because of the dark field burn. Uh, right, so what is the approach to do um, retrieval for the dark field? Now, um, uh, Kay Morgan, who's one of my supervisors, uh, she, in one of the previous impact um, seminars, she talked about this at length, so I definitely refer you to that talk um, if you're interested in this stuff. But uh, the short answer is that um, we use an extension to the usual transport of intensity based phase retrieval a la Haganada of 2002. And that extension is the so-called Fokker-Planck equation of X-ray imaging, where you have your typical transport of intensity equation and you've added a diffusion term um, in this D, which sort of models the kind of dark field blurring that you see in experimental images. Uh, now, if you don't change your energy and all you do is change your distance, this is reasonably linear. But if you change your energy, things become nonlinear very quickly. So the first thing is just to say, well, Let's linearize everything in energy, the typical first approach when you're trying to do dual energy type stuff and start with an assumption of a thin 
uh, sample with slowly varying dark field, slowly varying thickness, etc. And so if you do that, then you can use two different energy images and you can um, use this to get back to your projected thickness. Again, reminding you this is under the single material assumption. And so when you get back to that projected thickness, da -da, there we go. <laughs> So this is um, on the this middle image here is the reconstruction of the projected thickness from these two dual energy images um, uh, using our approach. And then on the right is um, dust using the higher energy image. So the image with fewer uh, dark field blurring effects closer to just a, a not a zero dark field image effectively. Um, taking that and doing um, phase retrieval and reconstructing the projected thickness uh, using usual um, phase retrieval. And so when you compare them, it's very clear that by accounting for dark field in your reconstruction, even by making a, a bunch of assumptions, um, you get much closer um, reconstruction back to what your simulated thickness was. So that's quite nice. By accounting for dark field, we can significantly improve our phase retrieval effectively, uh, but What's the next step? Well, we'd like to actually get an image of the dark field as well. And so the first step with that is if you want to uh, reconstruct the dark field, you have to isolate the effects of the dark field from everything else. Um, and so the most straightforward way to do that, uh, there's other ways of doing it, but the most straightforward is to just take your uh, reconstructed projected thickness and um, sort of re-forward model it using a transport of intensity equation and sort of repropagate it forward um, and now exclude any dark field effects. And so what you get is a sort of pseudo uh, dark field free image. It's a, as if there were no dark field effects. So that's what we have here on the left. The, the image on the left with the black um, line profile, that's the uh, measured um, uh, image from the experiment or a simulated experiment in this case. And then the image on the right is a kind of pseudo dark field free virtual image. I'm calling it the virtual image. Um, where you've sort of started to remove the effects due to the dark field. And so this is quite nice because if you take the difference between these two, um, you know, it's zero everywhere except where there's some dark field going on. So you can start to use that to, to do dark field reconstruction. Um, there's two approaches which uh, I'd like to talk about, which I've kind of been looking at, especially for this energy, um, dual energy um, dark field imaging, PBI dark field imaging. There is sort of a local approach, and this is something which is um, fairly common in, for example, uh, speckle based or single grid imaging. It's also often called explicit um, uh, uh, reconstruction. And that's where you take some small region of interest around each pixel and you measure something in that region of interest to get back to uh, what you're trying to get, what you're trying to measure. For example, in speckle-based uh, imaging, you might explicitly track how a speckle has moved in order to, to um, uh, look at uh, the phase effects or how it's diffused or how a single grid has diffused in a, in a small region. And so what we're doing here is we're measuring around each pixel um, in a small region, the visibility. The other approach, which is more similar to uh, the sort of usual uh, phase retrieval that we think of the, um, from the Pat Gannon paper in 2002, is a kind of global implicit um, retrieval method where you're doing something, uh, you're effectively you're inverting uh, the, the equation um, uh, to try and solve or, or retrieve the uh, diffusion coefficient. And so just to remind you, this is what my simulated dark field looked like. And so this is what we're trying to get back to with these different reconstruction techniques. When you're looking at just a local visibility, there's a couple of different ways of, of quantifying that. Um, and then uh, this is a result, I should put the reference, but this is a result from um, a paper by uh, uh, Paganin and Morgan um, from I think last year or the year before. Um, uh, which relates the, the change in visibility in a local, local region, uh, specifically of a, of a sinusoid pattern to the dark field um, 
effectively the diffusion coefficient of a focal Planck equation. And so we can use this kind of virtual image that we've derived from our reconstructed thickness propagated um, without dark field effects as a kind of pseudo reference image for, for this kind of reconstruction. And you get something which looks pretty good, a bit noisy, but it definitely shows you where dark field is happening. Um, and it actually is quite quantitative as well, which is nice. Um, as long as, excuse me, as long as the, the sort of local structure um, has a particular uh, uh, quality, it has to have a particular um, um, period essentially um, that you can use in this equation, uh, you get something which is, is quite quantitative. The alternative is a kind of global um, inversion of your Fokker Planck equation to get back to your diffusion coefficient. So here you can see we have the original image, and this is the, the kind of virtual image from TAE propagation is effectively what this is. And so you're taking the difference between those two, and um, which is the, the Laplacian of the diffusion coefficient um, times, a, times a multiplier. And so you have to kind of invert that. And so this is a, it, it's a tricky uh, thing. It's a, uh, generally not, not um, well-defined unless you have boundary conditions and so forth. Um, and so you can do it. Um, it's, you have to regularize this somehow. Um, but if you do, uh, you get something which isn't necessarily all quantitative, but it is a, a smooth um, a reconstruction, which definitely looks a lot more like the original than this kind of local reconstruction, where, of course, you, by its nature, um, are reducing the resolution. So that's quite nice that that kind of works uh, on the simulated data, at least. So let's look back at some of the experimental data. Again, this um, image of lots of different materials. Uh, using this method uh, that I developed this year um, to get back to your propagated thickness, not very interesting, just as you would expect. And then if you do, do the local dark field reconstruction, you get something which looks like this. And this is very nice because clearly there's uh, a strong differentiation between those samples in the bag, which we would expect to scatter strongly. Uh, for example, the pencil, the hairs in the makeup brush, and of course the microspheres. And those that you would expect wouldn't scatter, for example, the solid plastic playing piece and the, the solid comb in the background. Um, what about a global inversion? Well, there you run into some issues which is that this is very, very far from a single material sample. It's definitely not necessarily thin. Um, and so uh, you definitely get artifacts from where there's a strong attenuation, um, particularly the metal case here of the makeup brush and the, the lead in the pencil. Um, but what was quite encouraging was that if you just uh, look at um, a small region like this one here, where if you think about it in projection, what do we have? We have the plastic comb, we have the plastic Eppendorf tube here, which is filled with plastic microspheres, and a little bit of a cloth bag, but that of course is nowhere near as attenuating as the rest of it. And if you just focus on that region, um, since it's in a near single material um, uh, sample at that point, um, you do get a quite nice separation between the kind of uh, attenuating um, uh, things and scattering objects in the, in the image. So this is a nice uh, example here where you really can't tell what's going on at this point. Um, is that part of the lid of the Eppendorf tube or the microspheres there? And then when you look at the dark field reconstruction, it's very clear. Um, so these are some, uh, uh, these are sort of the main results from my work for the last little while. Um, and my hope is that this is something that can perhaps in the future be implemented as part of um, the impact project um, with our lungs at IMBL with the dual energy detector and uh, using perhaps a third harmonic or something to, to get um, an extended source. Now, one thing which does need to be pointed out, which is quite interesting. Oh, whoops, just ignore those two on the right for now. <laughs> is that, um, this all the local reconstruction, this one right here, that relies on there being some local structure present in the image in order for you to look at the reduction in visibility of that local structure. So 
you may not have noticed before, but in the images, in the in the thickness, projected thickness that I simulated, it's both these kind of large, uh, just kind of um, uh, projected shapes. And then I've also put on that a bit of a, a quickly varying pattern um, in order to give it a bit more structure, which is something you often see in a realistic sample. For example, in lungs, you, you get speckle um, patterns emerging when you do coherent imaging. And so this is something you, you typically see in a, in a um, sort of typical sample, um, especially one that generates dark field. And when you do this uh, uh, sort of virtual image using our reconstructed uh, thickness, you can very clearly see how the visibility of that local structure comes back. However, what if you have a smooth sample that generates dark field, but doesn't have any kind of local structure in the image? Something like this. So here we have the same uh, projected thickness, except with no local structure. And we're doing, we're applying the same uh, dark field blurring to it. However, uh, as you can see, there is no local structure that we can sort of get the visibility of back. Uh, what we do see, however, is that diffusion, dark field diffusion, um, sort of transports intensities away from uh, the material that's diffusing it outwards. And so you do see some sort of movement of these intensities uh, um, compared when you compare the original image to the kind of uh, sort of pseudo um, zero dark field image. Now at the edge, this isn't quite, this definitely isn't quite right. There shouldn't be quite this much happening. But the key point is that um, there is a sort of slowly varying change. And this is kind of, it, it does make some sense that you have a, a slowly varying dark field. And so that signal is slowly varying. And so even though typically what we look at is the kind of fine structure and the visibility of that fine structure that changes, which is what is used in a lot of techniques to, to assess the strength of dark field, you don't actually necessarily need that fine structure in order to see the effects of dark field. Um, small angle scattering. And so if you don't have that local structure, not surprisingly, local reconstruction breaks down completely. It just, it doesn't work, obviously. <laughs> um, and so you just get weird noise artifacts and so forth. Um, but what's nice is that the kind of global reconstruction still works effectively just as well as before. Um, the, the windowing here is, is definitely not correct um, because it does change a little bit because, of course, the regularization is affected by the fact that your, your sample has changed. But um, by and large, you, you get exactly the pattern that you would expect. Um, and this was something which was a little bit surprising for me um, since whenever we look at dark field, we're always trying to look at some structure being blurred out, um, some, some quickly varying structure. But it doesn't seem to be uh, actually necessary. It's quite nice. So uh, thanks for listening, everyone. So that was basically my work for the last year of uh, my PhD. And um, some future plans are definitely for the lung men data to just get that done <laughs> would be the first thing. Um, so to finalize the symmetry analysis to convert um, flux uh, into a dose and actually get some, some proper analysis done on that. Um, and then for the spectral dark field stuff, there's a whole bunch of things that I'm interested in doing. Uh, of course, the next step would be showing it on an energy resolving detector, or perhaps in the lab. Perhaps there's a way to generalize it um, so you don't need to make a single material assumption. Um, and of course, what would be really nice is to try and show it in the real lungs. So, the few people I want to thank um, my supervisors, Kay, Constantine, and Marcus, um, and then uh, David Paganin, who I've, I've talked to a few times and had some very helpful advice. And um, Samantha Alou, um, who uh, talked to many times and helped a lot. And of course, we used her method um, for uh, deriving the phase retrieval parameter for certain data. And Henrietta Bass is a um, PhD student from uh, TU in Munich, who's been with us for the last few months, uh, basically on exchange. And she uh, was involved in a lot of the initial analysis for the Langman data. Um, so big thanks to her. And then Lucy Costello, who's just started, who's looking at the region of interest um, uh, stuff. And then of course, a big thanks to all the Beamline staff at IMBL who were extremely helpful, and especially Anton, who uh, I talked to a lot about um, figuring out the reconstruction pipeline over at IMBL. So thank you very much, and thanks for listening.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Janice. That's a really great talk and um, uh, incredibly interesting work that you have going on there. Lots of Thank virtual you. claps on the screen. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. Um, we do have a little time for some questions. So would anybody like to, uh, you can use the raise hand function, pop it in the chat function, or uh, if it's difficult to, to use that raise hand, um, just unmute yourself and ask away. Sarah? Yeah. I have raised my hand. <laughs> oh, yes, I thought you were still talking there. Please. Oh, okay. Yep. okay. Uh, Janis, I have a few questions about uh, various aspects. Uh, maybe where to start. Uh, but perhaps the most trivial one, which hopefully Chris uh, can help to resolve, is that my impression was that the IGA detector version available at IMBL is not energy sensitive. Chris? Correct. Yeah, the uh, the one that we've got is yep. potential. Uh, it's got two thresholds. So you could potentially get two images out where the one image would be photons above threshold two and one image would be between thresholds one and two. Um, so it's kind of energy resolving in that respect. However, we haven't bought that um, option, but I dare say that we would consider it if it's going to help me on this. Okay, uh -huh. just, just, just to be sure that as it stands now, it's probably not possible or not easy to do that kind of experiment. I reserve judgment, actually. It may yeah. be that if we switch it on, it just slows the image rate down. So we'll only get 100 frames per second rather than 200. Yes, sorry. How is that? Really? Uh, sorry, Chris. I think we may, I, I can try switching it on. Yeah. And I think what will happen is that we will halve the frame rate. Oh, but you will have the energy resolution. Uh, maybe. <laughs> we can <laughs> okay. try. Okay. That was my understanding that you can potentially get two bins. And that's, that's right. At least for this particular technique, all you need. Right, right. But fair to say it hasn't been tested. So absolutely not. No. Right. Okay. But it was a motivating factor, but not the only one. <laughs> uh, the other thing, Yanis, in one of those uh, of your slides, you stated that you linearized uh, equi an equation with respect to energy. Maybe would you mind to maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Showing that slide and maybe explaining where is that linearization actually coming there? Uh, right. So in here, um, so I'm I'm definitely skipping many 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 steps here um, to get yep. to this point. I would refer you to uh, my paper, which will hopefully be on the archive fairly soon um, for all the steps. But the idea behind this is that you take. Um, the Fokker Planck equation for X ray imaging um, for a single material. So, in other words, uh, your intensity after the sample is just e to the minus mu t. Um, and if you uh, sort of make the assumption that your dark field is slowly varying enough that uh, sort of the second derivatives uh, are small enough that you can take it out of the, the Laplacian, and also that um, uh, within the Laplacian, the, the the higher order. So if you if you expand e to the minus mu t, kind of have one minus uh, mu t plus etc. And if you just ignore that plus etc., so the higher order terms, um, uh, that's that's what we're doing here in order to pull that out. And then for the attenuation term, I've left it as is um, because I decided for that because of, there's such a strong um, uh, difference in attenuation. Usually, I'm also including a small iterative step. In order to correct for that uh, non-linearity non here. Yeah, yeah, Yanis, but where is the energy here? Sorry. Well, where so is the energy? Me. So, so for example, mu, um, of course, depends on energy. So yeah, the, but non non-linearly, Yanis, non-linearly. Yes, e to the minus mu is a is no, but mu mu itself mu itself depends on energy non-linearly. Yes. And so and so does delta. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So we so you do have to assume. That, um, uh, that that the two energies you're changing are close enough together, you're using are close enough together that it's relatively linear. No, it's not. 
Sorry, but it's not. It's like uh, proportional to the third power of energy. Even if you're very close, it's still the third power. It's not the first power. Um, what am I saying? It's mu is proportional to e, e cube, right? Or lambda, uh, one of the lambda cube. Uh, well, you're using um, this is this is an input parameter at both energies. Sorry, so when I say linearize in energy, I perhaps should should say more linearize in in projected thickness rather than in well, energy. that's a that's a totally different. Yes, <laughs> yes. You, you can uh, certainly say that, and I would be absolutely happy with that. So uh, really? as long as uh, you are not saying it's linear with respect to energy, you, you know, I I did something somewhat similar years ago. And, and so uh, I kind of know this um, reasonably well. It, it cannot be linearized with respect to energy or wavelength. It, it's uh, not, going no, not, not in this method. No, I'm sorry. I should really say linearized in projected thickness. Yeah. And then you're using reference values for the change in energy. Right. Uh, OK, agreed. So maybe the last quick uh, question is that you showed uh, more than once the profile uh, of the beam at IMBL and the different roll off at different energies, right? Yes. Can you... For example. Yeah, here, for example. You see on the horizontal axis, you have pixels. I don't yes. think I believe that. Uh, pixels this... are, pixels, your pixels are very small, right? It's like 75 microns. So it, it cannot be a roll off on the order of millimeters. I, don't claim these. These were literally pulled off at the last minute just to show this effect um, in image J um, a few hours ago. So oh, I'm just, not let's let's sure let's, let's, just let's just think together. Let's just think together, right? That roll off happens uh, on the scale of centimeters, right? Not millimeters. You you don't have a beam which uh, which uh, dies off uh, within say two millimeters, do you? You no centimeters more like yeah 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 quite a few centimeters so and then yeah, and like the I say this this x axis right? I I I didn't write, even write this I shouldn't I shouldn't even have included uh, any units on the x axis right right so that that's the only issue that I have that yeah. it cannot that be that sense. that narrow it's not really pixels. It could be, I don't know, millimeters, for example, or something else, but it, it's uh, not going to be that narrow. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think I'm done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for your very challenging question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Yanis, do you want to just stop sharing your screen for a minute? Mm -hmm. Just, uh, just it's easier for me to see other people's hands, that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any further questions for Yanis? I don't think so at this stage. Last chance. No, okay, thank you. Well, with that, um, a, a very um, big thank you, Yanis, for sharing your research with us. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting. And uh, um, it's um, uh, an audience of um, novices and uh, true experts in this area. So, But we've all taken a lot away from your talk. A great presentation and slides as well. So thank you so much. They're really uh, top visuals. Thank you very much. Um, you're very welcome. I know that we've had a, quite a few people have indicated that they're pretty keen for the recording afterwards. Um, and I know that you've liaised with um, Magdalene about when that will be available, um, considering your other um, uh, requirements as well. So we do, we do understand that. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, so with that, I wish everybody uh, a good afternoon. If you're in the uh, southern hemisphere um, and uh, a good morning to our European colleagues.
Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks very much, Magdalene and Sarah. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, all.